to one. Welcome to another edition of the Apostasy Report. My name is Joshua, and you might want to have a seat for this one. This is going to be, for many people, very disturbing, perhaps akin to striking the shepherd himself, as the emotional connection with musical singers is usually exceeding those of regular speakers, for reasons we will briefly touch on. The Christian music industry, contemporary Christian music, or as I would call it, corrupt Christian music. That is the proper acronym uh, here used, CCM. None of this is approached lightly. It's rather unfortunate that this has to be said. And this is going to be, as far as I can tell, perhaps the most comprehensive video done on the entire Christian music industry. Um, Several people, I mean, probably hundreds, have covered some of these people individually, including myself. But really connecting the dots and seeing how all of this ties into one massive unified trajectory within the Christian music industry to leaven whoever is involved with it is uh, of the utmost importance. And I would contend to you right now, brace yourself, the entire, yes, the entire, meaning all, of the Christian music industry as you know it is corrupt from top to bottom. That is, anybody who is officially involved uh, or signed to a mainstream label and regarded as notable within the so-called Christian music industry is absolutely compromising to some degree. Understand that behind every musician, behind every so-called worship artist, there is a theology, and there's usually a specific teacher. You cannot divorce the theology from the doxology, the singing. If the theology is not good, the doxology will not be good either. And a lot of people put the cart before the horse. There is a massive disparity between old hymns and the contemporary Christian music world in a general sense. But even for those things that appear to be good, perhaps a song or two here or there, are theologically sound. On the whole, again, there is a specific theology being championed behind every singer, every band, every artist. Today we're focusing on the musical aspect. And there is a question as to whether or not the whole notion of a worship leader is biblical whatsoever. And I may decide to cover that in a a different video. Uh, But you're not going to find a hint of what we refer to as a worship leader today, as some sort of uh, staffed position within a church, anywhere. You will find singing. We've got a whole book of psalms, well, several books within a book, devoted to singing. Yes, the notion of singing is absolutely valid. Nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with writing the songs, but what this has turned into um, is a cheap imitation And as you're going to see, it's not even really an imitation of the world's music industry. It's part and parcel of it. As I said, sit down. I'm sure somebody's sacred cow will be tipped over. Before we begin, copyright disclaimer for fair use. A lot of people tend to get real sensitive when things like this are touched upon. Let it be known that the entire purpose of this video in its whole comprehensive format and in every specific video that is played is going to be reviewed for the specific purposes of either research or teaching or criticism, etc. This video in its entirety is transformative in nature, and therefore any video that is cited in here and commented on will be used for the purposes of a transformative video. Therefore, nothing is being replicated uh, that is not being commented on specifically. So, let's begin, shall we? The Power of Music, Mind Control by Rhythmic Sound. This could be an entire study on its own. In fact, uh, psychologists uh, in the hundreds at this point have studied this topic uh, quite at length. And um, just to establish 
a, a baseline for the power of music. And the reason that people tend to get so offended is that um, unlike certain other mediums, your mind is uniquely affected by music in an emotional way. There's an, a unique connection to the artist because there is a very high aesthetic in pleasant sounds. Uh, well, in this particular study about rhythmic sound, um, it says here, the mystery runs deeper than previously thought, according to psychologist Annette Shermer, reporting new findings today at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in or New, Orlean, New Orleans. Rhythmic sound, listen, quote, not only coordinates the behavior of people in a group, it also coordinates their thinking. The mental processes of an individual in the group become synchronized. Yes, brain waves are in sync after a certain amount of time listening to the same rhythmic sound. Influence is massive in this state. Some people have questioned whether or not there's a, a, an unintentional hypnotic induction of sorts. And many have argued that that's exactly what happens. Now, specifically, this happens in a live concert setting. There are independent studies about decibel levels. The louder the music, the more influential as well. And it tends to induce a state of euphoria with loud music in particular at a certain decibel rate that mimics being drunk or buzzed on alcohol. It's a, it's a similar effect that it has on your mind. Add to that lighting levels and so forth, and there's an entire psychology of music that is intriguing to look into. But just to set the tone, we're not dealing, uh, what here, what we are dealing with is the battle for your mind, okay? Martin Lloyd-Jones had a fabulous message on this topic. I recommend looking it up, the battle for your mind. And when you are synchronized with a group of other people and behavior uh, starts to become uh, coordinated, influence becomes easy. It almost necessarily follows. So that when you're primed in a certain state of heightened emotion, the message that comes after it, not to mention the one that's coming through it, is absorbed in a different way. Keep that in mind. Now, music was created by God. It's a good thing, but as with any good thing, it can be abused and it can be used against you to a degree. Be very aware of these things. The modern concert state, uh, for example, this picture, this is not an accident. There's a reason that the modern music industry in general has found the concert setting that we have to be ad advantageous. People like it. It produces feelings, uh, uh, triggers huge amounts of dopamine to go off in your brain. It's very similar to interacting with narcotics. Well then, where do we start? Universal Music Group, one of the big three. You've got Universal, you've got uh, Warner Music Group, you've got Sony, Sony Records, Sony Music Group. These are the big three, and Universal is the biggest of the three. Universal Music Group is, uh, for example, here are just some of the artists that Universal Music Group represents. You've got Ariana Grande, Lady Gaga, Gwen Stefani, um, Nicki Minaj, uh, you know, George Michael. Um, here, we'll take a look at some of their hip-hop artists. They got Tupac up here, 50 Cent. You get the idea, right? Some of the biggest names in the music industry are represented by Universal Music Group. Universal Music Group owns several other labels. Among them are Capitol Records, and more. Well, we'll just take a look at a few of them. So you got Capitol Music Group. This is owned by Universal. We're still on Universal's website. Uh, Astral Works, another label. Blue Note Records, Capitol Christian Music Group. Capitol Records US, Capitol Studios, Caroline, Deepwell Records, Harvest Records, Metamorphosis Music, Motown, Quality Music Control, and Virgin Records. And under each one of these, 
There are others, such as Interscope and so forth. It's a quite a convoluted business. Again, this is an entire study all by itself. But we are here focusing on Capital Christian Music Group, which is owned by Universal Records. And we're going to take a look at some of the artists that are represented by the same people that represent uh, 50 Cent, Dr. Dre, Drake, uh, Jay-Z, Lady Gaga, and... Uh, basically anybody famous at this point, right? There you go. Nas, Nelly, Ludacris, right? All these people. The same people that represent them also represent Amy Grant. I'm sure you've heard of Amy Grant. She was uh, pretty big in the 80s. Um, I don't know who these two are, frankly. Perhaps you do. But here's some other names that you'll no doubt be familiar with. There's Cody Carnes. There's Chris Tomlin. He's a big one. Chris Kilala of Jesus Culture, David Crowder, uh, what's that, Danny Gokey right there, Hillsong United, of course, there's Jeremy Camp, there's Hillsong Young and Free, there's Hillsong Worship, they're really, they're really cornering the market on bands there in the Hillsong group. You got Jesus Culture out of Bethel Church in Reading, you got Kerry Job, Kim Walker-Smith, who is... Uh, an integral part of Jesus culture and one of the founding uh, staple pillars of the movement. Uh, who's this? Mac Brock and uh, the Passion Band with uh, Louis Giglio out of Passion City Church. Um, well, and some various others. Social Club Misfits. I guess these guys are pretty popular these days. Uh, we the Kingdom. Toby Mac. Very popular. You get the picture. Some of the most notable names in the Christian music industry today are effectively owned by Universal Music Group. This is a worldly conglomerate uh, that is guided by the principles and the dictates of this world. It is not biblical, not even kind of. Uh, however, they, like any savvy business person, realize that there is a massive market within Christendom in the, in the general sense. In other words, they know they can make money by marketing these artists, and so they so they do. This particular record uh, label here, it's called uh, Providential Label Group, is owned by Sony Music, one of the big three. Warner Brothers or Warner Music Group used to own. Uh, they sold they sold the stake that they had in a Christian company. And so, as far as I know, it's only Universal and Sony that uh, also own specific Christian labels. Here are some of the artists represented by uh, Sony. Uh, this would include Casting Crowns, there you go, Matt Marr, Matthew West. Who do we got down here? Um, some of the, it's just so hard to keep up with these people. Thankfully, I am out of this loop. Zach Williams, Vertical Worship, 10th Avenue North, right? Some pretty famous names, and these people are all um, signed to a label that is owned by Sony Music. Again, another worldly music label. Um, now, if these artists aren't united by the record label that owns them, they will be united by the, uh, by the booking agent that they use. And the booking agent effectively um, manages their touring schedule and all of those details. And so, Jeff Roberts and Associates, a popular uh, booking agency, your concert ministry partner, their slogan there, they represent people like Bethel Music from Bethel Church, uh, Bethel Music Leaders, they're doing the Hillsong thing there, um, Casting Crowns, uh, Flame for King and Country, they're pretty popular. Francesca Battistelli, I Am They, Jordan Felice. Uh, there's there's Mac Brock again, Ledger, who's part of um, Skillet. Uh, Leland, they're out of Bethel Church, and were part of Bethel Music in its earlier days and then kind of branched off. There's Matt Marr again, Matthew West. Michael W. Smith, North Point Worship, boy, there's Skillet. I did an entire video responding to Skillet and showing uh, their waywardness. This is a group that literally tours with Marilyn Manson and other people that are overtly demonic. Young Escape, Vertical Worship, Zach Williams, all the Bethel music leaders, right? These people are all under Jeff Roberts. Uh, you get the picture. 
And you've got, uh, the, I think this is William Morris. Um, they represent some others, such as, uh, there's David Crowder there. Now, again, this is the booking agent, not the record label. Um, Jeremy Camp, KB, Lauren Daigle, Lecrae, right? You know these people. Mercy Me, Natalie Grant, Phil Wickham, Shane and Shane, Switchfoot, Tadashi, 10th Avenue North, Trip Lee. Some pretty prominent names with uh, this booking agency who rep- represents uh, basically anything you can think of. This is just the Christian category. As you can see, they represent comedians, country singers, adult contemporary. Uh, it's a worldly booking agency that manages touring affairs. It's an entertainment-based industry. Okay. Um, uh, this is another uh, booking agency. There's you got Amy Grant there. You've got uh, Chris Tomlin. You've got um, Danny Gokey. Okay. The point being, there are secular record labels and secular booking agencies that are really the engine behind all that you know to be the Christian music industry. And there are some independent. Christian record labels, such as Reach Records, which we'll get into briefly, but the trajectory is identical. Um, It only adds weight to the fact that we are dealing with an ungodly set of principles, right? It's going to make sense of things as we get into them when you realize that the people managing these artists are godless. This is a world-based industry. The same people that promote Lady Gaga and Jennifer Lopez and 50 Cent and all of the worldly... Uh, devilish music that you might hear, and I'm not just using this term in a in a hyper fundamental conspiratorial kind of way. You need to understand that at root, the things espoused by the world, Satan has his finger on them. I shouldn't have to explain this at great length. That doesn't mean that everybody's singing about the devil overtly. It means that they are absolutely devoid of anything to do with God, and therefore they are led by the ruler of this world. Satan. Now, why are all these Christian artists, so-called, yoked up with these secular companies? The thing to keep in mind here that is different about this industry from most others is that in the realm of entertainment or the arts in general, unlike the realm of plumbing or restaurant touring, right? You are dealing with a realm that primarily propagates ideology. Primarily. The fundamental business of a plumber is to plumb. The fundamental business of a restaurateur is to dispense food and things. The fundamental business of the music industry is to dispense ideas, ideologies, and philosophies. In this sense, it is the uh, most most dangerous and subversive uh, industry around, and the one that ensnares people. And uh, because some objections might be, well, this is their job, right? What are they supposed to do, right? Nobody can work for uh, just an exclusively Christian leader, you know? Well, that's true. But if you work at a furniture store, and your boss happens to be a heathen, his primary business is selling people couches, not selling people ideas, When you get into the realm of the arts, whether that's acting, uh, book publishing, or music, you are getting into the realm of ideology and philosophy. You are getting into the realm of something inherently religious in the sense that whether the person claims to be uh, secular, right, an an out-and-out atheist, does not mean that they are not giving you ideas and principles to live by. In that sense, it's a religious realm. It's a realm that is rooted in ideology. And therefore, to have anything to do with those who are propagating foul, demonic ideologies as their primary source of business and revenue is to yoke yourself to something ungodly and something that is inherently intended to wittingly or not, cause people to stumble and to believe falsehood. You can buy a couch from a heathen. 
You can't listen to Lady Gaga without digesting an ideology, without digesting a specific worldview. There's a radical difference. And if you're yoked up with people that are propagating ideology primarily, you're in a very dangerous spot. And so then the question becomes, as I said, um, you know, if if this business is so important, then that's really the question. What's the motivating factor for the artist to get into this business? Well, it is a business. Yeah, but they have a talent to sing. They have to make compromises somewhere. This is radically unbiblical thinking. Radically unbiblical. There's just zero justification for it. All of that is worldly mindedness. Well, I have to go along to get along. Or you can find another job. Find me a paid worship leader in the Bible. Love to see it. Not somebody who sings to the Lord in spirit and in truth. But this profession of worship is a, a relatively, it's, it's a new anomaly. This is a 20, exclusively a 20, uh, 20 and 21st century issue. You had hymn writers back in the day, but we have luxury in listening to these songs. Well, let's just go through some of these songs, 100 top worship songs, all right? We're just going to look at a few here. How about number 16 on the list? How Great Is Our God, written by Chris Tomlin, okay? Big songs here. How about number 25 on the list? What do we got here? Blessed Be Your Name by Matt Redman. You, You might be familiar with that one. How about number 29? Mighty to Save written by Hillsong Worship, right? I'm listing a few songs here that I suspect many people might be familiar with. Your Grace is Enough. Now, this version was sung by Chris Tomlin, but it's actually written by Matt Marr, who's a Catholic. So apparently his grace isn't enough. Ironic indeed. Uh, Number, what is this, 49? Uh, That is not 49. Oh, 89, I'm sorry. 89, what do we have here? Break every chain. Well, I can't read my own writing. Um, Oh, Your Love Never Fails, 87. Jesus Culture, right? Some really big songs you might be familiar with. I just want you to get acquainted. These are top 100 worship songs. You'll see the same names over and over. Bethel Music, Matt Marr, Casting Crowns, Chris Tomlin, Shane and Shane, Elevation Worship, The Newsboys, Matt Redman, Passion, The Passion Band, Hillsong Young and Free, Natalie Grant, Carrie Job. Okay, it's the usual suspects. And these are massive names. And you're going to see just how interconnected all of these people are. But again, as I said earlier, be aware that behind every collective or behind every artist is a specific theology and a specific teacher. So behind Passion Music, for example... Out of Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia, as well as uh, Washington, D.C., under the leadership of Ben Stewart and Louis Giglio, who's the founder of Passion City uh, Church, well, you have Louis Giglio. So behind the Passion Band, you have the theology and, or the lack thereof, of Louis Giglio, okay? Now, uh, Six Step Records is owned by uh, Passion uh, City Church, by the way. There's Passion City Music. And you can see, perhaps at the bottom of the screen here, Passion City Church, the Passion Conferences, and Six Step Records, uh, who also has David Crowder, the Passion Band, and Sean Curran, all right? So this is a record company that is owned by Passion City Church. Behind uh, Bethel Music, you have the theology of Bill Johnson from Bethel Church in Redding, California. These things do not exist in isolation. They come out of specific movements or specific churches. Okay? Behind, uh, what is this? Elevation Worship. Behind Elevation Worship is Stephen Furtick, the narcissist, right? Some people have termed him a narcissist. Stephen Furtick, who reads himself into every passage in the Bible. All right? Behind Jesus Culture, you have Banning Leibisher here, who is a something of a protege of Bill Johnson and right out of that same movement. So, just as a foundation, right? behind Hillsong is Brian Houston. Behind all of these artists and behind all of these bands is a specific theology. And it seems to be that the most important thing, the theology, is the thing that is most neglected. 
And so as long as you're a good singer and you can say Jesus and you're popular and you look good and you have enough tattoos and your jeans are skinny enough, then every church will book you. It's ridiculous. And I say that as somebody with old tattoos, who, by the way, does not advocate for tattoos. You want to be more like Jesus, stop getting tattoos. At best, it's an indication of immaturity. A topic for another time. Banning Leibischer. Let's start here. Jesus culture. Many of you are familiar. Many of you sing their songs. Kim Walker Smith. There's Chris Kilala. Chris Kilala. What is Jesus culture? Tell us what's Jesus culture? What is what is at the heart of Jesus culture? Jesus culture is a movement that is all about raising up revivalists in the earth. And actually never officially was called Jesus culture. It's actually the name of the movement. Now, by the way, this is them at the Hillsong Conference in uh, 2011. There's a promo for the 2012 conference the following year, but they've all been friends. All of these large groups have been friends for quite some time. So Jesus Culture, as Kim Walker-Smith said, is a movement that's all about raising up revivalists in the earth. Whatever that means. All right. I'm Bay Leacher, and I'm here with Bill Johnson, our senior pastor, author, teacher, preacher, all-around good guy. One of our senior Okay. So she was just praying like, Lord, why'd you choose Redding? Right. And the Lord said, I didn't choose, he said, I didn't choose Redding, I chose Bill. Okay. Just to uh, provide some foundation for those who, for some reason, might not know anything about this. And you should. Bethel Music, these are the people behind it, right? So they're talking a lot about Bill Johnson. Uh, God didn't choose Redding, California. He chose Bill Johnson. All right. It was just a little taste of who Bill Johnson is. The feathers started just appearing and falling in meetings, and then they started falling in our homes and in restaurants and things like that, just unusual things. You know, there, there are signs that make you wonder. There will have wind that will gust of wind that I'll get hit with and hands for years. We, what was it? And uh, we've had gold dust appear in people's hands for years we i don't ever talk about it but frequently during worship we actually had it today benny and i both saw gold will start falling during worship this time i think it started falling during our prayer time okay this is not just wrong this is insane okay bill johnson i don't know that the word false teacher is strong enough but that's the word we're going to use he casually talks about feathers just appearing in people's homes and now uh, we've had it for years gold dust just appearing in people's hands and a gust of wind and a glory cloud and this is the tip of the iceberg bill johnson is a man who says that if your gospel doesn't include mandatory physical healing it's a false gospel which is ironically a false gospel proclaimed by him I hope you're familiar to some degree already with Bethel, but just to provide some foundation, the man behind Jesus culture and Bethel music is this, meaning that those singers, Kim Walker Smith and Kim Kilala, believe this insanity. And therefore, to have any form of fellowship, even the pretense of fellowship with those who are teaching such insanity, is to commit effective treason against Jesus himself. God is seeking those to worship him in spirit and in truth. You don't get to divorce truth from the equation, and you don't get to start singing worship with radically false theology. The God that they worship and the gospel they proclaim is false. By his own definition, if you don't proclaim mandatory healing in your gospel, it's a false gospel. This is Jesus culture and Bethel music. These are the leaders behind it. This is the theology they bring to the table and that will eventually, inevitably, seep through their mantras, seep through their like a river, like a river, constantly. Well, what does that even mean? You see the same thing in Hillsong. Spirit lead me, spirit lead me. Eight cycles in a row. Get ready for it. Bethel Music, okay? Here's, here's their, they're having a big conference. Um, Heaven Come Conference, right? Uh, there's uh, Bill, Bill Johnson's uh, daughter, Jen Johnson, and Brian Johnson. Of course, you got Bill, 
Christine Kane, uh, I believe she had her roots in the Hillsong movement. Uh, Rich Wilkerson Jr. You got Levi Lusco, who's a great friend of the Calvary Chapel movement, and Greg Laurie specifically. We'll get into that in a bit. Um, these are the people, and and also he's good friends with Stephen Furtick and uh, Carl Lenz, right, from Elevation and from Hillsong. And then, of course, you've got the the whole Bethel Collective down here. Okay? Passion Conference 2020 just happened, uh, I don't know, what was it, a couple of weeks ago. Passion 2020, who was there? Well, you got Louis Giglio, the Pope Kisser, who founded the whole movement in Passion City Church. There's his wife. You got their group, Passion, the Passion Band, who is uh, headed up by Kristen Stanfill. Okay? You got David Crowder. You got Sadie Robertson. You got, um, is it, yeah, Robertson. Lecrae. Elevation Worship out of Stephen Furtick's church. There's Carrie Job, Tadashi, John Piper, whom a lot of people think is not wayward and clearly is. Buckle up, everybody. Sean Kieran, who uh, we saw signed to Six Step Records with David Crowder, remember? Cody Karn, there's Levi Lusco again, right? The same guy that's over here with Bill Johnson, the insane man who thinks gold dust and feathers appear. And by the way, he goes on to defend that these feathers... He said, well, the Bible does say that uh, God shields us under his wings. And he said, well, people said that's not literal. He said, well, that's what I thought. This man actually contends that God has literal wings and literal feathers, and that's where those feathers came from. Again, I say, this is insane. Well, that's Bill Johnson. And remember, Levi Lusco is part of this little group. Well, there's Levi Lusco hanging out at the Passion Conference with Trip Lee, with Ravi Zacharias. I've done an entire apostasy report on him. Please view it. Christine Kane, Social Club, Misfits, Misfits, Hillsong, Andy Maneo, and America's favorite quarterback, Tim Tebow. Oh, boy. Now let's jump into Hillsong, who arguably uh, set the tone, set the stage pun intended, for most of what we're seeing, for a lot of what we're seeing. Of course, founded by Brian and Bobby Houston, longtime friends with uh, modalist, Trinity-denying heretic and prosperity guru T.D. Jakes, Priscilla Schreer, who's popular in women's Bible studies, all the megachurch world over, Cash Luna, I I guess it's appropriate that Cash is his name, because that's what these people are after. I don't know who he is. Uh... Robert Madu, um, Tasha Cobbs Leonard, you'll see her name a lot, Michael Todd. Okay, that's Hillsong. Let's get a little perspective here, just briefly. 15 countries, tens of thousands, right? It's, I think Hillsong is its own denomination at this point, and arguably the uh, largest selling Christian label uh, or or. Christian, I don't know if you'd call them a genre. I mean, they're part of Christian music, but Hillsong as a group has probably sold more albums than most, if not all, Christians. Uh, Tens of millions. Okay. Well, their prayer meetings are more like rock concerts and their musical messages from God often become chart toppers. With followers like Justin Bieber and Kendall Jenner, Hillsong is not your ordinary church and is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. That's true. To the one and only Brian Houston from Hillsong. Brian, welcome to Studio 10. I've actually been to one of these concerts for stories, and um, it's, it's, it's like a Beyonce concert. It's huge. <laughs> well, what, what is it about Hillsong that draws so many young followers? I think it's relevant. I think the message that we represent, you know, it's uh, timeless. The, but the methods have to change, so I think that we do what we can to reach 2015. Well, let's just notice what he didn't say there, right? She says, what do you think draws these people? What was conspicuously absent from his answer? Jesus, truth, right? He mentions this message, right? Well, we have a timeless message. I'll tell you why people are drawn to it all the world over. The world loves it, and he's on secular talk shows that love it, and they're interviewed by some of the the basest uh, shows around, he and his other pastors in the Hillsong movement. They're loved by the world because they're a part of the world. The world embraces it because it reeks of itself. The world recognizes it as kindred. That's why she said, boy, it looked like a Beyonce concert. It does. 
It's nearly identical to any of those. Well, no wonder. Uh, I don't know who Beyonce is signed to, but uh, I know Jay-Z was represented by Universal Music Group, so they're represented by the same record label. Is it any wonder that their con- concerts look the same? suppose I shouldn't be surprised to find out that Beyonce is also represented by Universal Music Group. The point is, pick the artist, it looks just like a worldly concert, because that's exactly what it is. It is not rooted in truth. It is rooted in marketing. It is rooted in euphoria. It is rooted in a temporal experience. Okay, listen. Here's Brian Houston. This is this is the fundamental Brian Houston back in the day. New from Pastor Brian Houston, money. There's not one person in this building who doesn't need more money. And if you say, well, I don't need more money, then I would say you have a very poor outlook on life. You'll learn why you need more money. Because money is a tool that can accomplish phenomenal things. This man has been part of the prosperity group for years. Though he's arguably been outshined by people like Joel Osteen or T.D. Jakes or Joyce Meyer, uh, what you're going to find is that he's good friends with all of them because they have the same love. It's a love of money, a root of all kinds of evil, if not all of it. And if you don't think you need more money, you have a real poor outlook on life. All right? These are the type of people that creep into widows' houses and fleece them. These are liars, right? The uh, remember Paul talking about false apostles who, uh, you know, were charging people money to hear messages of truth and whatnot. Brian Houston has been a money preacher for years, and he has just found a more clever way to do it without always talking about money. He has slightly shifted the focus to general self-help. He has found what people want. Now, understand this. There's an old um, axiom uh, that, a, that an old uh, grifter or a con man once said. He said, if I know what you want, I can take you for everything you have. And so when it comes to the con and the con man, what is happening? The dynamic that is taking place, generally speaking, there's no innocent party there. The classic cons of the ages, typically, and the most effective, work to exploit greed in the mark or the subject. So, the con man is absolutely trying to take advantage of this person. But, as the name implies, they are instilling confidence in the mark that that person is actually taking advantage of the con man, right? So, You see this played out in uh, those old scenarios where the guy comes in pretending not not to know how to play pool. And they make a series of bets and he loses. And then he says, I'll bet a thousand dollars. The other person is all too happy to take advantage of him. When the con man then displays his true skills and takes that person for all their worth. He did it by exploiting their greed. They weren't innocent, And nor are the people that are taken in with Brian Houston or the like. They're not innocent. Their greed is being exploited by the devil. Little do they know. They think they're going to get something out of these self-help messages that rely on their inner strength. But they've got this thin veneer of the name of Jesus and no substance of him. So they're, they're going to get something and they get got. Instead, there are no innocent parties in this scheme. Uh, Remember, we hear false teachers described as deceiving and being deceived. They are victims and perpetrators all at once. Oh, they're deceived. Make no mistake mistake about it. Uh, But they're bent on deceiving as well. And they revel in their own deception. Brian Houston, you need more money. Well... Is it any shock that T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen are friends of his? This is at the Hillsong Conference a few years back. Craig Groeschel from LifeChurch.tv. That version Bible app you have in your phone, that's owned by 
this deceiving man right here. There's Carrie Job, Leland from Bethel, Judah Smith, a good friend of Carl Lentz, who's one of the Hillsong pastors in New York. T.D. Jakes, when he has his conference, of course, he invites his old buddy Brian Houston over. Brian Houston and uh, Joel Osteen, I think you can see that there. They've been close personal friends for quite some time. There's Joel Osteen with Carl Lentz out of Hillsong, New York. Who do we got here? Joyce Meyer celebrating 30 years of Hillsong Conference, right? There she is back at the 2012 conference, a longtime friend of the entire Hillsong movement. I hope you see the foundation we're setting here. That but behind this entire movement, before the music ever comes out, before a lyric is written, this is the theology that is feeding into it. And it is impossible for that not to eventually leaven you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump unless we wish to make the Holy Spirit a liar. Those words were not said in vain. These are doctrines of demons being propagated by this whole crew. And here's another one of Brian Houston's friends, Nikki Gumbel. Nikki Gumbel of the famed Alpha Course out of Holy Trinity Brompton uh, over the pond in England, which again is a, an entire study. Any one of these people that are mentioned could be talked about at length, but we're building a comprehensive picture about the entire music industry, okay? So we started with Hillsong. Now watch this. Holy, Holy Trinity Brompton, led by Nikki Gumbel, who's a longtime friend of his you need more money friend Brian Houston here's uh here's Nikki Gumble back at the 2011 Hillsong conference watch this Nikki, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. It's great to be with you. Okay. Now, this is your first time in Australia? Not our first time in Australia. We've been first time at the conference. First time at the Hillsong conference, yeah. How are yeah, you yeah. finding it? We are absolutely, absolutely, I mean, there just aren't words to describe it. It is so amazing. We've had three days of just the, the love, the welcome, but also the inspiration. There is so much. I don't think I've ever had three days in which I've learned so much or been inspired so much and seen a model that is so the thing that we want to do. And Stop right there. Seen the model that is so the thing that we want to do. He talks about his inspiration. This is exactly what we want to do. Well, who's we? Well, it's he and his cohorts at Holy Trinity Brompton. So what did they do? Well, based on Hillsong's model, they created this. The Holy Trinity Leadership Conference, HTB Leadership that's, Conference. That's Listen. Infinitely greater than what divides us. In what unites us is infinitely greater than what divides us. That's the whole theme. These men are all ecumenical underneath it all. What unites us is more, uh, how does he phrase it? Well, it's infinitely greater than what divides us. Who's us? Well, us, among other things, includes this guy right here. Well, I knew Pope Francis before uh, becoming Pope. Uh, I didn't know uh, Justin Welby. Just I saw him in focus. In this is one of the men that elected Pope Francis to the papacy. This is a staple member in the Catholic Church and a pretty high-ranking one to be on the voting committee of the Pope. This is what Nicky Gumbel's all about. What unites us is infinitely greater than what divides us. And what unites them? Well, it's not truth. It couldn't possibly be truth. If you have questions about Catholicism, please see the recent video I just did on that topic. This is who Nicky Gumbel has. And what does whatever this man's name say? Listen to what he says. All of them together. You'll hear his voice here. Together. Father, make us one. Jesus, make us one. Holy Spirit, make us one. Amen. Make us one. Well, who's us? Well, there you got a whole group of people, including Joyce Meyer. Big shock, right? And you got the Archbishop of Canterbury who was there, Justin Welby, and a whole host of other representatives from various denominations, Anglicanism, and so forth, right? And so, it's all about uniting each other. You're going to see this is the common theme, all right? 
Well, what does this have to do with worship? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. This is to establish who and what Nicky Gumbel is and exactly what his inspiration for what he does was. And that was Brian Houston and the Hillsong movement. Well, this is Nicky Gumbel, also fond of the Pope, like Louis Giglio and others that we're going to see. So it's no wonder that he had one of the men that elected Pope Francis at his conference, excited to unite with those people that he claims uh, have we have much more in common than what divides us. This is a common talking point of the ecumenical heretic Rick Warren, who does similar things and has found himself at the Vatican on multiple occasions. Well, let's get a listen to Matt Marr, very popular contemporary Christian music artist. Listen. There's, there's been a buzzword floating around Catholicism now for about 40 years called the New Evangelization. And I think what a lot of... With the New Evangelization, a buzzword floating around Catholicism, what's he talking about? Listen. So welcome, welcome to everybody. If this is your first time joining us at the Catholic Ecumenical Track, you're very welcome. Uh, my name is Father Emmanuel. I am a Franciscan friar of the Renewal. Um, uh, my name is Audrey, Audrey Assad, and I'm a singer, songwriter, worship leader. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Matt Marr, and I'm an itinerant uh, worship leader and songwriter, and originally from Newfoundland, Canada, and, and then lived in Phoenix. Just proof that God has a sense of humor. Okay, that's good enough. Uh, Matt Marr and Audrey Assad are Catholics, and I bet you've heard of both of them. I believe Audrey Assad is mixed up with the Bethel group. Uh, in any event, they both are here at the IHOP conference. It's called the, it was called the One Thing Conference out of IHOP, the International House of Prayer, led by Mike Bickle, who is also a friend of the Bethel organization. He and Bill Johnson are friends since the 90s and were part of a group that were termed the Kansas City Prophets. Now, Matt Marr's a Catholic. What was this video all about here? This is Matt Marr uh, talking about the uh, Alpha Course. But the sort of depth of the sacrament, everybody to be on board. The new evangelization, when I think of Alpha, that's what gets me most excited about it because I feel like it's reaching out in the world and, you know, drawing them back into a place where... This is a promo video for Alpha, which is created by Nikki Gumbel at the HTB Leadership Conference. So they went and sought out their Catholic friend, Matt Marr, to do a promo video for their nonsense Alpha course, which is an entire topic on its own, right? This is a supposed evangelism course that Rick Warren says is one of the greatest tools of evangelism in the 20th century at the time that he wrote that. And generally speaking, if Rick Warren approves, that's probably not a good sign. That's Matt Marr and Audrey Assad at the Catholic Ecumenical Track at the IHOP conference where all sorts of strange nonsense occurs like fire tunnels and, uh, you know, the same gold dust and feathers falling mentality. That's where they find themselves, except Mike Bickle and their whole crew are now embracing Catholicism, just like Nikki Gumbel. And this is a popular worship artist, part of, I mean, one of the biggest contemporary Christian music artists of all time. I wonder how many people even know that Matt Marr is a Catholic. Remember that song, Your Grace is Enough? He wrote it. When your church is singing that song, that's who wrote it. Now here's Matt Marr at an event in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, playing for the Pope and talking about just how privileged he is to be a part and of the church in general. Listen to what he says. how much God loves the church. The church. And I think it's really difficult in these days to be a Christian. And to, 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 you can stand up and say, I love Jesus all you want. I want you to notice that when he refers to the church, he's referring to his mother church, which is the Catholic church. His definition of church and your definition of church aren't the same. But what's happening is this strange convergence. And the Catholics are all too ready to welcome Protestants into their circles because you can bet your bottom dollar the Pope is not bowing down to anybody. It will eventually be you that bows down to him. But Matt Marr believes in a false gospel a false sacramental gospel, and is yet embraced 
by the broader Christian community. Here you go. Listen. That's the great thing about the movement of God, the movement of the Holy Spirit, and specifically even as, as a Catholic, what makes it so amazing isn't just that we bring the sacraments to the world. It's that we bring the sacraments to the world, says Matt Marr, right? Unashamedly embracing his Catholicism, and why wouldn't he? Everybody accepts him. Everybody, including guys like Matt Redman. Remember uh, Matt Redman? What did he write? Uh, well, he's wrote a, about a few dozen songs. Here you go. Matt and Matt, good to have you guys. It's good to be here. <laughs> Thanks, man. I don't know that we've ever done one of these where you guys... Yeah, Matt Redman and Matt Marr are friends, songwriters, and so forth. And it shouldn't surprise you that Matt Redman is a staple feature in Nikki Gumbel's ecumenical nonsense. Matt Redman, big but time worship created, leader. Blessed be your name, never, you never let go. And most of all, wonderful, wonderful friends to us. Matt and Beth Redman, welcome. Yes, Matt and Beth Redman are wonderful friends of this ecumenical deceiver. Because their mission is not truth, their mission is the business of making music. And whatever furthers their ability to tour and whatnot, well, they'll embrace it. Here they are again at another Nikki Gumbel event. Matt, um, that song you were just saying, that, that was extraordinary. That song you wrote, 10,000 Reasons. Yeah. If you thought Matt Redman was sound, you should think again. But I bet you're going to be really shocked now. I bet you didn't know this one. Hey everyone, this is Matt Redman. I'm actually backstage at Love Life Conference 2013. It has been a beautiful time. Absolutely amazing. Joyce's teaching has been stunning as always. Then Andy Stanley also and Priscilla Shira. It's just been immense. And, and to gather in this place and to get to lead worship with thousands and thousands of women pouring their hearts out to God together. It's just been so powerful. If you haven't made it to Wait. this... That name Joyce sounds so familiar. Surely he wasn't talking about Joyce Meyer, was he? That's exactly who M Matt Redman was talking about. Matt Redman has led worship for Joyce Meyer's conferences for some time. So it's not just Nicky Gumbel and his ecumenism. It's not just Matt Marr the Catholic and his Catholicism. It's Joyce Meyer and her uh, false teaching that Jesus was a born-again man and that he had to suffer in hell. And amongst other things, right? She supposedly renounced or acknowledged that she g went a little overboard with the prosperity teaching last year. But rather unlike Zacchaeus, her, her repentance didn't include restoring to the people she had built for millions. No, she's smooth sailing in her millionaire lifestyle. And even if she hadn't preached prosperity, she preaches so many other heresies, it's dizzying. Not to mention her general usurpation of God's word as a woman who teaches and has authority over men. But it's not just Matt Redman. There's Chris Tomlin. Did you know that Chris Tomlin tours with Joyce Meyer and Stephen Furtick? Heresy on heresy. Who's this down here? Lisa Osteen Combs. That's Joel Osteen's sister right there. Yes, Chris Tomlin, the brilliant songwriter, as he styled here, is also a tour mate of Joyce Meyer the heretic, Joyce Meyer the prosperity teacher, Joyce Meyer the false teacher. Yes, that is Chris Tomlin. And I wonder how many of you have a so-called worship leader that's all too happy to promote the ministry of Chris Tomlin. There's Chris Tomlin and, uh, and his friend Matt Marr. Let's see here. So th and I thought this is the coolest guy. There you go. There's Chris and Matt Marr on tour together. Right? So Chris Tomlin is a fan of Catholicism too, or at least Matt Marr's brand of it. There's no discretion. So Chris Tomlin embraces Catholics. Gosh, here he is singing with a, a nun on stage. Right? These are the people he brings up to sing with him. If you want to love a Catholic, you should tell them the truth about Jesus. You should tell them you worship what you do not know like Jesus did to a woman in John chapter 4. He didn't leave her to go back to her false worship. He proclaimed truth to her, not Chris Tomlin. Nope, he'll sing with Joyce Meyer, he'll tour with a Catholic, and he'll bring a nun up on stage so that they can sing together and give everybody the impression that there's really no problem. 
They're united in fellowship, so-called, and worship. Now, this is false worship. Oh, it's singing, all right. And it's a form of worship. Uh, But they worship what they don't know. That's Chris Tomlin. There's Chris Tomlin hanging out with Joel Osteen at a Hillsong conference. Surprised? It gets worse. Like I said, I hope you're sitting down. Here's Joel Osteen for those that need persuading that he's an overall bad guy. The Pope has obviously been reaching out yeah. and has been a force of moderation in comparison to his yeah. predecessors. What do you I, make of I it? I think the Pope is fantastic. You know, I just think his tone, his humility, his, you know, I loved when he said the other day, you know, and it's, the, it's, it's our view too. We're not trying to, you know, make this a little bitty narrow thing. Anybody's welcome. We, we may not agree you know, 100% on doctrine and theology, but you know what? We're will the, the church, the Catholic Church, our church. It's open for everybody. So I like his tone. Not it's open for everybody. We're not trying to make this a little bitty thing. We're not trying to make this a narrow way. We're trying to make it a nice broad way. Do you remember what Jesus said about the broad way that leads to destruction? He said, "Yeah, we might not agree on doctrine or theology, but you know, no biggie, no biggie." Because Joel Osteen is not concerned with doctrine or theology. He's concerned with making you feel good, lulling you to sleep while you coast on to perdition. Joel Osteen is not a minister of God. He's a minister of Satan. Again, I don't say that lightly. Okay. So excited to have one of our favorite ministers in all the world, Joyce Meyer, here today. We know how much Joyce you Meyer. love her. We love her so much. Give her a great big hand clap as she comes, Joyce Meyer. And there's Joyce Meyer. Thank you. One and same with Joe Osteen. Well, you guys are awesome. And this was only about six, seven months ago. You are just... You can see the networking beginning. Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer. Hey, hey, look, there's Chris Tomlin again with Joyce Meyer and Rick Warren, who says, if you love Pope Francis, you'll love Jesus. There he is accepting his Dove Award, uh, a knockoff, cheap imitation of the Grammys, doing everything to not just appear worldly, but actually to be worldly. Joyce Meyer. Oh, I bet you didn't know Phil Wickham toured with Joyce Meyer too. Now, this is from the Joyce Meyer website. I'm not just pulling this up from nowhere. This is Joyce Meyer Ministries or JoyceMeyer.org. All right. Columbus, Ohio, August 23rd to 24th, Nationwide Arena. Yep. So if they can't get Matt Redman and they can't get Chris Tomlin, they'll get Phil Wickham. These are three of the biggest, most respected names in evangelical contemporary Christian music that are embracing some of the rankest heresy available. Phil Wickham, Chris Tomlin, Matt Redman. What's going on over here? Rick Warren and Chris Tomlin at uh, Night of Worship. How are you? Chris Tomlin tours with Rick Warren too regularly. Now here, here's an interesting thing. You have on stage Chris Tomlin's uh, Worship Night in America. Right here, you've got Chris Tomlin playing the piano. You've got Matt Redman up here. You've got Kim Walker Smith from Jesus Culture. And then you've got uh, Phil Wickham here. And I forget this guy's name. But you see how all of these people mingle together and tour together. They're all friends. Truth is not in them. Their theology is about as thin as rice paper, and all of them, all three of these guys especially, tour with and lead quote unquote worship for Joyce Meyer Ministries. This woman, Kim Walker Smith, has a bizarre testimony of visions of Jesus, and no wonder her so called pastor uh, thinks that gold dust and feathers just appear in people's hands and in their homes. This is simply music of enshrouded in deception. There you go. All of them participating, leavening each other and leavening those who participate with them. That may in fact be your church. That may in fact be your worship leader. That might be your own iPod. You might want to start thinking about deleting some songs out of there. What do we have here? Phil Wickham touring with Kim Walker Smith and this other guy, something Mac. I forget his name now. There you go, Mac Brock. 
just announced sing along tour. So Phil Wickham, when he's not touring with Joyce Meyer, and when he's not singing with Chris Tomlin on his night of worship, independently tours with Kim Walker Smith from Bethel, right? This is Bill Johnson behind her. Now, Phil Wickham is a huge part of Greg Laurie's Harvest Crusades, which we will get to in just a bit. There's Phil Wickham for you. Here's Phil Wickham at Joyce Meyer back in, gosh, this was in 2010. This is nothing new for Phil Wickham. There he is, singing at Joyce Meyer's ministry conference. For the last decade, he has been involved with Joyce Meyer. Did you know that Phil Wickham has been touring with a prosperity false teacher, Joyce Meyer, for the last decade? Hmm. Does your worship leader, does your pastor know that? Or are they just negligent when they promote his ministry to thousands of people, to hundreds, even to tens? Nobody seems to want to look into things anymore. Ah, that it sounds good. That's good enough for me. Hmm. Well, here's the Hillsong Channel. Hillsong Channel shows. They feature people like Daniel Fusco, also a good friend of the Calvary Chapel movement. There's Robert Morris from Gateway Church who threatens people with demons if they don't tithe. He says demons will come and get you if you don't tithe to his church. Who else we got down here? Joseph Prince, Mr. Hypergrace, John Gray, who was a former pastor, I'm using the word loosely, a former hireling at Lakewood Church alongside Joel Osteen. What do you got here? Uh, it's half of these names, I don't know. Billy Graham.tv, I wonder who signed off on that one. United, Zion, Gentis, and Franklin. There's Skip Heitzig from Calvary Chapel. He's one of the regional leaders of the entire Calvary Chapel movement. Somebody might want to check them. If you haven't seen the Calvary Chapel report I did, please take some time to view that. You got Jack Graham down here who is also a close personal friend of T.D. Jakes and Stephen Furtick. It's quite a tight network, of course. you got Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer. There's Stephen Furtick right up here. Creflo Dollar. Right? David Jeremiah. Did you know David Jeremiah was on the Hillsong Network? Some more Creflo Dollar. T.D. Jakes, right? Okay. You have all these different shows uh, just teeming with, with heresy. This is about the filthiest spiritual channel around. Hillsong Channel. Okay. So who was at the Hillsong Conference last year? Well, we had Brian Houston. You need more money, remember? You have Louis Giglio, the Pope Kisser, who's the founder of the Passion Movement, the Passion Conferences. Joseph Prince, who's a friend of uh, Joel Osteen and so forth. And uh, remember, Angel Feathers and Gold Dust, Bill Johnson over here, who says, if your gospel doesn't include mandatory healing, it's a false gospel. Time would fail us to enumerate all of the individual heresies of these people. You get the drift here. These are the people. This is the theology being propounded from the Hillsong Conference, wherein many musical artists are there to lead people in false worship to a God they claim to know but don't. And so, what did we have here? There you go, Joseph. That's just listing all the same people, okay? There's Bill Johnson backstage at the Hillsong Conference. But I want it done in a way without the music in the background, without all the stuff. Funny that he would talk about all not the stuff going on that is important and valuable. Yeah. I want it happening in a context that they can do. Dupl- Listen, done in a way. With- He's talking about healing. That people can be seen. We think that oh no, it's reserved. Yeah. That blew my mind because a lot of said. Now, I can pray over you all and, and, and begin to, you know, as far as healing, but I'm go- I want you to reach, stand up, yeah. and I want you to, to pray for the person yeah. with the ailment. Yeah. Yeah. That blew my mind because a lot of people don't recognize that you, too, can lay yeah, hands right. on the sick mm-hmm. and they will be healed. Ooh, yeah. Let's talk about that because a lot of people don't think. They think that, oh, no, it's reserved for the gift. Is reserved. You need to understand, these people are hyper-Pentecostal extremists who believe again, in mandatory healing as part of the gospel itself. And so, the miraculous, now by the way, Bill Johnson was one of the men who championed, fought for, and defend the heretic Todd Bentley, who claims to kick old women in the face and ran off with his secretary and had an affair and so on and so forth, right? He was one of the so-called apostles in a movement that is termed, generally referred to as the New Apostolic Reformation, where another man named Cheon referred to Bill Johnson as an apostle 
a distinguished apostle, no less. Bill Johnson then stood over a man named Todd Bentley who was writhing on the floor, claiming to be under the power of the Holy Spirit without any self-control, and proclaimed that he was going to lead lead this movement and they were going to stand with him. And uh, shortly thereafter, he had an affair. Uh, He's recently been declared to be unfit for ministry after multiple sexual allegations. Uh, But if those had never happened, the man was a false teacher from the start. But it's no wonder that he would approve of him. He's a false teacher all by his lonesome. So they think anybody can heal anybody at any time. Outcry Conference, this other movement... Here's the 2015 flyer, Hillsong, Jesus Culture, Carrie Job, David Crowder, Passion Band, Bethel Music, Lauren Daigle, Trip Lee, DJ Promote, Nick Hall, and Sean Groves. Nick Hall is the man that put together the 2016 Reset Conference in Washington, D.C., where Pope Francis Francis gave the opening invitation, where you had Lou Engel of... Uh, The Call, formerly The Call, now The Send, who's also a friend of Bill Johnson, Lou Engel on his knees, bowing before two Catholic delegates from the Vatican, pleading for unity, more ecumenism. What you are witnessing, you need to understand this, and I've said this before, if we are not witnessing the great apostasy, we are witnessing a great apostasy, a massive apostasy, by our standards, at least in our context in the Western world. This is a complete wash. This is a complete loss. When I say the total, the totality of the Christian music industry is wrong and wayward and false and corrupt, I mean all of it. All of it. I defy somebody to prove to me somebody that's not. All of these people are partaking in wicked works of darkness. 2 John 11, Romans 16, 17, etc. What do we have here? Outcry 2015 recap. Let's let's get a quick sample here. Really, really powerful about unity, you know, and, and the wall is coming down and all of us just and all of us just getting in the same space to lift up Jesus. That's that's pretty special, you know. There's something really, really powerful about unity and the walls coming down and us lifting up space. The translation is doctrine doesn't matter. We all need to come together. This is the basis for ecumenism as we're using the term. The truth is not what unites us. We are united on the basis of something else. And if you're not united on the basis of the Holy Spirit who leads people into all truth, then the unity is a false unity. Again, to reference Martin Lloyd-Jones, he had a teaching on Ephesians chapter 4 covering this um, marvelously, and it's quite important. This is a false unity that's being talked about. Now, Kristen Stanfill is Louis Giglio's sidekick in the Passion Band out of Passion City Church. Right? So this whole team here, the Hillsong, Jesus Culture, Trip Lee, Bethel, Carrie Job, Crowder, there's something amazing about unity, he says, and the walls coming down. And that's their whole goal is everybody unites under this nondescript name Jesus. It's Jesus in name only. Well, any Jesus that doesn't have a problem with this is not a Jesus found in the Bible, it's a false Jesus. This is no light matter. What do we have here? Switching gears just slightly. Have you heard of For King and Country? They're chart toppers. See For King and Country and Matt Marr at the Washington State Fair Columbia Bank Concert Series. Oh, they also partner with Matt Marr the Catholic. You know why? Because For King and Country has no discretion, integrity, or anything virtuous either. They are businessmen. Business-minded with a business trajectory, and Matt Marr's good for business. He's popular, so they'll tour with him. And vice versa. They don't care about truth. How could they? They were part of the soundtrack of The Shack. William P. Young, the universalist who denies the existence of hell, and uh, amongst other things. Here you go. What the book and the movie has, I think, done a very classy job of doing, if anything, is going, hey, knock, knock, knock. Uh, don't put him in a box, you know, don't put faith in a box, don't put God in a box, don't put Jesus Christ in a box, 
don't label them a goody two shoes or a great pair. Like, this is bigger than you think it could be. What is he even talking about? This is bigger than you think it could be? Translation, don't put God in the Bible. That's what he means by box there. Don't give me, don't give me sound doctrine. Right? There will come a day when they will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap up for themselves teachers. Don't put God in a box. Don't label Jesus a goody two-shoes. No, let's go ahead and describe God as a black woman and a Chinese woman and an Arab man and whatever in a movie that intimates at universal salvation. Where effectively, faith is of no consequence. Everybody gets saved. You all get a medal. You all get a prize. Them. Again, this entire movie, which I covered in the Skillet video, please go watch my response to Skillet and John Cooper for a much more in-depth analysis of The Shack and all of William P. Young's heretical assertions. I hope some of you are familiar with this ridiculous uh, book and movie, but for King and Country, I think it's great because we don't have to put God in a box. Well, we have to keep God in the Bible. Because that's where he describes himself to us. So if you're getting out of, out of the Bible, don't call my Bible a box because you don't like the way God is described. And when you start creating a God of your own fancy, you're really steeped in idolatry. The God described by William P. Young does not exist. They use the name Jesus just like Islam uses the name Jesus. It's not the same Jesus. It's the same name. It's a different Jesus. The Bible tells us about another gospel, another spirit, and another Jesus. Look at some of their lyrics. Here's one. God only knows. Wide awake while the world is sound asleep and too afraid of what might show up while you're dreaming. Nobody, nobody, nobody sees you. Nobody, nobody, nobody would believe you. I don't even believe what I'm reading. Every day you try to pick up all the pieces. All the memories, they somehow never leave you. Nobody, nobody, nobody sees you. Nobody, nobody, nobody would believe you. God only knows what you've been through. God only knows what they say about you. God only knows how it's killing you. But there's a kind of love that God only knows. God only knows what you've been through. You, you get the picture here. Now, so they're using the word God. Um, and as you can see, it is so nondescript that this can and does apply to anyone anywhere. It is designed to have a universal appeal. It appeals to as many markets as possible. And this is why many elements of pop culture embrace these guys, because, well, it's not offensive. It's not talking about the exclusivity of Jesus. There's no sound theology here. God only knows what you've been through. Uh, you're lamenting a sad situation. Well, of course, this is something everybody can relate to. We've all been in a sad situation, I'm sure, you know, to some degree or another. Nobody would believe you, right? Whatever the inspiration was, the point is, this is, it's not exclusive even to this song. Here's Burn the Ships. How did we get here? All cast away on a lonely shore. I can see it in your eyes, dear. It's hard to take for a moment more what we've got. Burn the ships, cut the ties, send a flare into the night, say a prayer, turn the tide, dry your tears, and wave goodbye. Step into a new city. We can rise up from the dust and walk away. We can dance upon the heartache. Yay, light a match, leave the past, burn the ships. Right. So as he described it, he wrote this as a result of his uh, wife coming down with uh, some sort of prescription uh, drug addiction. And burn the ships is supposed to be a metaphor for letting go of the past or something like that. Uh, the point is there's a very common theme of them writing songs that have absolutely nothing to do with worshiping God and could appeal to as many people as possible. They're not intended for a Christian audience. And yet churches invite these guys to come and serenade them with worldliness. Again, they don't want you to put God in a box. Don't keep him in the Bible. Let's embrace the universalism of William P. Young. Okay. Uh, here was the Outcry 2016 uh, promo video. Who did we have at that one? Yeah, Carrie Job, Jesus Culture, Martin Smith, Passion, Elevation Worship, Brian Houston, of course. The same usual suspects joining together. But uh, as I said... It only gets worse. David Crowder, 
Oh, let's see here if I can find this. This record we did um, called A Collision, which was this. We didn't say it at the time. Yeah, I guess so. Um, is the centerpiece is the Eucharist. And what comes after this, and the beautiful thing about the Mass is the centerpiece is the Eucharist. And, and it's a celebration of sorts. And, and here, the Requiem is, is got so much of, of the stuff we were saying in this thing, but in a way that's connected to the liturgy and history of the church that, that connects us to a thing that's bigger than just our present. Wait, wait, hold on. What church is he talking about? He just uses the term the church, uh, just like Matt Marr used the term the church. Notice what he said. The Eucharist is the centerpiece, and he's talking about the liturgy and specifically a requiem mass. This is exclusive to the Catholic Church. A requiem mass is a mass for the dead. This is a mass given for the dead. He composed an entire album called Give Us Rest, which is based on the Roman Catholic requiem mass. And here he is lauding the the false Eucharistic Jesus, which again, I did cover in some detail in the Catholic video. If you have questions, please watch it. Is David Crowder a Catholic? Well, he's at least sympathetic to Catholicism. And if you're an evangelical, if you call yourself Orthodox, and you're embracing this man's ministry, you are partnering with somebody who's partaking in wicked works, somebody who doesn't care about truth, somebody who's all too happy to promote a false gospel of Catholicism because, boy, he likes the liturgy. So he wrote an entire album called Give Us Rest. Now you're talking about the church. Notice how he phrases it. In this thing, but in a way that's connected to the liturgy and history of the church that, that connects us to a thing that's bigger than just our present moment, that's bigger than just uh, our our local church that's even, you know, that these songs existed in and, and are part of, and it's bigger than just what's happening here in the States. This is, this is some connected tissue that goes around the world and then back to the beginnings of, of the church. Yeah, he's describing apostasy, uh, whether he knows it or not. Yeah, you're right. It is bigger than your local church. This is going around the world. This is the theme. We have, there's, uh, Nikki Gumbel said it, Kristen Stanfield said it, they all practice it. The things that unite us are greater than the things that divide us. This is the common principle and the through line within all of this. So now you got David Crowder embracing this garbage. Not surprising, is it? Well, he's part of Capital Christian Music Group. There's Amy Grant. All right, this is their YouTube channel, Hillsong, Young and Free, Kim Walker Smith. Um, I'm not sure where, oh, there's Crowder right there. Crowder, Danny Goki, right? We, we saw some of this. Oh, boy. Here's Matt Marr with the Gospel Music Association. This is the company that owns the Dove Awards. Here's an interview they did with Matt Marr where he says, well, I do get to write with Chris Tomlin, Matt Redman, Jason Ingram, and others. They're amazing writers. But if I had to say outside of my sphere of friends, there's a massive list of people from Ryan Tedder to Pharrell Williams to Paul McCartney to Tom Petty to Billy Joel to Keith Urban. Okay. What's your favorite song that you've written with another artist? Listen, right now, Come As You Are that I wrote with David Crowder is up there. But White Flag that was written by a group of us for the Passion Conference 2012 was a special moment. So as you can see, David Crowder is a close personal friend of Matt Marr as well, and they collaborate to write songs together. So it's no big wonder. Uh, and I believe Matt Marr also, I believe, was on the Give Us Rest album on one of the tracks there, one of the records. Uh, but Matt Marr, uh, look at, written by a group uh, of us for the Passion Conference in 2012. He was writing songs for Louis Giglio in the Passion Conference for nearly the last decade. Casting Crowns, do you like them? Well, they tour with Matt Marr as well. So let's just get them out of the way. When I say this extends to everybody, I mean it extends to everybody. Here's the Dove Awards. Kirk Franklin, Amy Grant, uh, the Newsboys, Toby Mac, Need to Breathe. Oh, yep, Joyce Meyer and Rick Warren. There you go, Passion Worship. Okay, and a tribute to uh, Billy Graham, Mark Burnett's The Bible. Well, Mark Burnett's a Catholic too, and his wife, Roma Downey. The Dove Awards are a complete sham. What do we have here? Oh, there's Rick Warren 
doing a press conference at the Dove Awards. This man is a false teacher. He's been a false teacher. Uh, one of a man he calls his uh, a dear friend who's departed now, uh, something of a Muslim universalist. I couldn't even call him a good Muslim. His name was Maharathut. Rick Warren said he was a genius. Dear friend, right? He calls false uh, teachers, uh, open professors of other religions, geniuses, and his comrades in arms. Rick Warren has never been sound. Of course, you got the Shaq here winning a uh, film of the year at the Dove Awards. That should give you just some idea of how bad it is. But th the entire presence of the Dove Awards is uh, nearly comically bad. This, this appears to be some kind of joke. I mean, can you imagine Jesus going and partaking in, in an award show? Talk about vanity. How vain can you be? This is a, a cheap mimic of the Grammy Awards. You know? Well, it's just Western Christianity, hard at work. This isn't Christianity. This is worldliness. That's what this is. All right. Well, the Shack won Inspirational Film of the Year. That page is out. Of course, TBN partners with them. Uh, what do we got up here? Gospelmusic.org. Again, the Dove Awards are owned by the Gospel Music Association. Okay. I want you to understand that they have a statement of faith, right? This is, there's nothing, um, they're not, they are overtly presenting themselves as representatives of Christianity, Gospel Music Association. We believe the Bible's inspired, right? They got a six point statement of faith. The moment you team up with somebody that has a statement of faith, if they're promoting falsehood, you're now sharing in that falsehood. That's how it works. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand the foothills of Christianity. You don't have fellowship with these works of darkness. Now, who's part of the vice president squad of the Gospel Music Association? Here's Chris Estes, who's one of the managers of Bethel Music. I believe he's even the vice president of Bethel Music. In any event, his teacher is Bill Johnson. He's one of the guys making crucial decisions for the Gospel Music Association. That shouldn't surprise you. They have a conference. This Immerse Conference is a, a, an outworking of the Gospel Music Association. This is their, if you can see up top here, it says GMA Immerse. It is the Gospel Music Association Immerse Conference, okay? This is their conference. And as you can see, right up top, we got Bethel Music, right? Gateway Publishing, there's Bethel Music, Bethel Music. They got three Bethel Music representatives as part of their speaking and artist coalition for the Immerse Conference. The New Apostolic Reformation and the people that believe gold dust and feathers just start appearing, among other things which we're going to see, like uh, astral projection. These are the people behind the Gospel Music Association, which puts on the very worldly Dove Awards. You can keep your Dove Award Please, what is this here? Compassion International Presents. What is this? The Roadshow 2018. Let's see who some of these people were. Featuring Four King and Country and Matthew West and Natalie Grant. Who else? Bethel Music. Yeah, that's right. King and Country tours with Bethel Music too. There's Zach Williams. All of these people are together. Social Club Misfits. No discretion. This is um, something of a spiritual orgy is the best way I could describe what's happening here. This is not fellowship. This is filthy, spiritually transmitted diseases. Listen, this is a woman named Deborah Reed at Bethel Church, just to remind you of how bad Bethel is, talking about casually taking kids to heaven, just on a whim, right? Just voluntary trips to heaven. Um, out-of-body experiences, which could only be described as astral projection. Listen. And being a guardian and an equipper of not only the young, but those people who lead the young. And, oh, I have one more thing to show you. This is so cool. Okay, we, we take our kids to heaven. I mean, who doesn't? Okay, our kids go to heaven. And, and people that know how to do heaven things take them to heaven. And so we have a middle school that, that was... Tour guides, is that what they're going? Okay, they take her. Tour, she's not joking. They have tour guides, she says. 
Somebody called out from the audience. They have a name for this. There's a, there's a position within Bethel Church called tour guides, like it's a field trip to heaven. Our middle school kids to heaven, so now I'm sorry, but that's fun. Okay, you want to know if you're really going to heaven? Okay, you know, you don't, don't go. But, but these guys, they think it's really cool. They meet each other. They, they see each other in heaven, hang out. I, I mean, the, the neat thing about it is it is real to them because it is real. No, it's not. This is a delusion. And if it is real, it's astral projection, which we just don't have time to get into. But th- this is uh, an occult practice where people have aimed to have out-of-body experiences. And there's some reason to believe some of these people actually do. They are playing with a demonic realm if this is actually happening. She just casually talks about taking trips to heaven and meeting each other, having some kind of -of out-of-body experience. This is the insane theology coming out of Bethel, which includes Jesus Culture, Kim Walker Smith, and Chris Kilala. If this were the only centerpiece, if this were the only common denominator that we are looking at, it would be bad enough. But alas, they all have their independent... Now, listen to this guy my goodness this is part of the bethel kids ministry a little girl where the angels were in the room and she pointed off and said there's one over there by the first graders so i asked her i said do you know why he's here and she took off and i think she went and talked to the angel and when she came back she said he's here for healing so i had her send all the kids over to the first grade mat where the angel was And just a little bit of time later, every single child was healed in the room, and no one even had to pray. I'm not trying to be mean here, but he looks a little loopy already. This guy is off, even by worldly standards. I don't know how anybody would see this and say, yeah, let's let's leave my kids with this guy. Well, he looks way too awake. I don't know how, how to describe it. Again, I'm not trying to be mean here. There's something very off about this individual casually talking about an angel and casually talking about everybody getting healed in the in the circle and whatnot and here's uh bill johnson going on about his glory clouds and his angel feathers and whatnot so just to to recap you got the heaven come down conference with these these people all these are all bethel representatives bill johnson christine kane don't forget levi lusco Levi Lusco, a good and longtime friend of the calvary chapel movement and the harvest crusade movement part of the Bethel uh, touring crew at this point. Keep that all in mind, and we will move on to, what do we have here? Oh, this is, this is Hillsong Young and Free. Uh, My goodness, there's, just to show how insanely involved these concerts are, but you know they look like Beyonce concerts, and apparently the page isn't loading anyway, so we'll just skip that. How about Lecrae? A lot of people like Lecrae. He's a little different. See, he's on his own record label that he uh, co-founded with another gentleman. I forget his name. Ben, perhaps. um, Called Reach Records, which has other artists such as Tadashi and Trip Lee. And some people have been concerned about Lecrae for a little while. We're going to get a few statements from Lecrae who was at the Passion Conference this year and for several years uh, prior. Let's just listen to Lecrae's general outlook at this point. A meal. Like, I just don't, I can see, I guess conceptually people say, like, selling your soul means, like, you're going to compromise your beliefs for some kind of success or something like that. Yeah, like somebody invited, you you get signed to your new label and they invite you to a party and you have to go to the back room where they're doing some kind of thing. You never had that happen? Nah, not at all. You know what's funny, like just transparently is I've had more success both like in terms of like fanfare and and financial from the faith-based market. So it's weird when people say, oh, you sold out for this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, "This this ain't like more popping in terms of like you know, where they really paying and doing it's all this more stuff. more lucrative in the yeah, faith-based exactly, market. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing this out of love for my people. I'm doing this out of love for hip-hop. I'm doing. Well, a little bit of truth just came out there. It's more lucrative in the faith-based market. That's what it is for them. It's a market. You are a client and nothing more. This isn't worship. This is a market. It's market-driven. 
That's why there's no discretion about who they're touring with, who they're partnering with. There's none at all. Why? Because it's about making sales. It's not about proclaiming truth. And you might say, well, but I heard Lecrae when he was a young man just starting and he sounded so rooted, so biblical. Maybe. Whatever he might have seemed to be at some point, that's not what's happening now. And this isn't new. It's just gotten progressively worse. But he says, the faith-based market is actually lucrative. But that doesn't stop him from trying to be embraced by the world. Because once you are fully embraced by the world, there's just no question that the world is a more lucrative market. But make no mistake about it. The faith-based market is quite lucrative. And that's why you're seeing all of this. These people make a lot of money And perhaps you're one of the ones giving it to them. How does Lecrae think of himself? Sure. You know, people people label uh, label you a Christian rapper. They do. You're okay with that? I mean, you know, they label Chance a Christian rapper. True. They label Kendrick a Hebrew-Israelite rapper now. I don't (laughs) know. Right, right, (laughs) right. right, It's just like, you know, man. I mean, people are going to say what they're going to say. End of the day, it's it's good music. It's good lyrics. You can find whatever you're looking for inside of it. And um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't call myself that. I don't go by any of those like, you know, genre titles sure. or whatever. No, he doesn't call himself that because he doesn't want to be put in that uh, in pigeonhole. In fact, within the music industry as a whole, they refer to the Christian genre uh, as a ghetto because very often it's it's very difficult for people to come out of that. And these artists want to, and he has somehow found the formula to break away. He's doing everything in his power to not associate with the name of Jesus. No, get that on. Why? Well, because he's on worldly radio stations being embraced by the so-called culture, right? I just make music for the culture. Lecrae wants to be as uh, relatable and urban as possible now. It's all about the culture. It's not about Jesus. Uh, He doesn't call himself that. He's not a Christian rapper. Eh, I don't call myself that. Here's Lecrae being way too cool for school at the Grammy Awards a couple years back. Listen. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you know, first of all, it's just even even the labels. Like, I don't try to do gospel music. I'm not trying to be a gospel rapper. Yeah. I'm a hip-hop artist, you know what I'm saying? And so I just want to be honest about what I what I believe in in my music. And so, um, you know, in the same way Kendrick is going to be honest in his music about his beliefs, I'm going to be honest about mine. And, and I just think if it's good, it's good. If it's good hip-hop, it's good hip-hop, and it should just be embraced. And that's really the, the aim for me. So I'm glad to be out here amongst people who do good music and who can appreciate good music. And some of it may talk about God, some of it may not. Out. Well, when it comes to, to your music, man, you definitely are standing in the lane and league of your own. Was there anybody in particular who you like to work with or maybe kind of bring it to your realm a little bit? Yeah, I think, you know, Janelle Monae is a big one, man. I think she's a phenomenal artist. And, uh, you know, I, I love just create creativity and creative people, man. Let's just stop right there. So, again, bending over backwards to dissociate himself from the label Christian, even gospel, much less Jesus. He's just an artist. He's a hip-hop artist. He makes good music. He loves creativity. And, oh, by the way, he'd love to work with Janelle Monet. Okay. Who is Janelle Monet? USA Today article, Pansexual is not the same as bisexual. Janelle Monet is bringing visibility to us all. Here's the artist Lecrae wants to collaborate with to propagate ideas and worldviews. Yeah, I think it, I think it's great. I mean, you know, I'm proud to be a young African American uh, queer woman, uh, bisexual, pansexual woman, and pansexuality uh, can mean something different to those who identify with it. For me, um, it's not about your gender. It's not about you being a woman or a man. It's about your spirit. It's about your heart, and that's what I see first. This is the artist Lecrae wants to collaborate with because he just likes creativity. He's not a gospel singer. He's not trying to be labeled as that. He just wants to make good creative music, even with a pansexual like uh, Janelle Monet. Who better to give ideology to the youth than this individual at Lecrae's discretion, apparently. Do you understand? Do you understand just how bad this is? This isn't any one individual. It's all of them. It's all of them. This is not a joke. It's David Crowder. It's Matt Redman. It's Matt Marr. It's Bethel Music. It's Passion. It's Elevation. It's Lecrae. It's Trip Lee. Wait a second. Isn't Trip Lee good? Well, Trip Lee is signed to Lecrae's uh, record label. You can see right here at Reach Records, 1K Few. 
I don't know where they get these names. Andy Maneo, Gavi, Holvi. K, the names are, I don't, this is just bizarre. KB, Lecrae, Tadashi, Tripoli, Wandy, Wanda, I don't know. What up, Erg? What? I give up. I don't know. I don't know what's up, quite honestly. But here's Tripoli. He's one of the artists signed to Reach Records. All right. I wonder where Tripoli learned how to distance himself from Jesus. Maybe it was his mentor, Lecrae. But then at the same time, like when people hear Christian rap, which is not what I want to call myself because they think of something very different than what I do. People hear Christian rap, they think, oh, this is music that he makes just for Christians to listen to. So if that's not me, I shouldn't listen to it. So that's why I don't want to call myself that. I just want to say I'm a rapper. And if you listen to my music, it's going to be clear that I do love God. And I'm going to talk about God. Hmm. About God. Something like Lecrae. Yeah, don't call me a Christian. Yeah, you can listen to it. You'll find what you're looking for in there, but don't call me a Christian rapper. Yeah, I wonder if Lecrae had any influence on Trip Lee there. All right, here you go. Kanye West joins Lecrae, Hillsong Young and Free, as headliner for 2020 Teen Conference. Though it might be relevant, we're not going to get into all the ins and outs of Kanye West, uh, who has found himself on stage with everyone from Joel Osteen to uh, members of what would be termed as the New Apostolic Reformation, uh, hyper-Pentecostal, signs and wonders movement, et cetera, et cetera. Again, a massive marketing ploy. At, at the very best, I could say that there's zero direction. Um, and there's no good reason that I've heard to believe that Kanye West is a genuine believer at all. This is another Brian Head Welch story in the making. Remember when he came out of the band corn and it was everybody was jumping on this story because it was good for sales? Right? Why do you think this why do you think this conference welcomed Kanye West? It's good for promotion, it's good for the market, it's good for it's good for business. What happened to Brian Head Welch? Right, he wrote all these books, people took advantage of him, things went downhill, he started showing up at Benny Hinn conferences, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then according to him, God told him to go back into the band corn where he found himself on a tour called Hellfest not too long ago. God told him to do that because Jesus was a friend of sinners. I'd commend you to an article I wrote on that topic. That was a false accusation accusation leveled against him, which also included Jesus is a glutton and Jesus is a wine bibber. Well, those two things weren't true and neither was a third one. There's a radical difference between being friends with somebody and lovingly preaching the gospel to them. Calling sinners to repentance is not the same as going on a tour called Hellfest. But there you have Brian Head Welch. At best, what is happening here is Kanye West, if, if there was any spark of realness, he's being derailed left and right. And I haven't heard anything uh, to suggest that there is a genuine profession of faith here, despite somebody who graduated from John MacArthur's school of or seminary or what have you, uh, so-called discipling him. Um, what we're seeing here is is a is a transition into a different market. <sighs> Again, that's an entire topic for itself. But what about Tripoli? You know, Trip Lee is a pastor, and he's a pretty sound guy. He came up. In fact, I mean, gosh, relevant uh, so-called apologists like, uh, you know, Todd Friel from Wretched Radio say he can preach like nobody's business. Because you might think that if you're in the more conservative part of the church, this doesn't affect you either. Our church doesn't sing Hillsong, right? Maybe you listen to guys like Mark Dever, and Al Mohler, and oh, who's that, John Piper? Isn't that the same guy we saw at the Passion Conference with Bethel and Hillsong and Levi Lusco and all those people? Yeah, it's the same guy. It's the same John Piper. But here's Trip Lee. He can't be that bad if he's next to these guys, Al Mohler and Legan Duncan and Mark Dever. Boy, they're friends of John MacArthur. So how bad could Trip Lee really be? Well, Let's take him at his word. I'm glad to see, I got to see my friends from Hillsong United tonight. Love these dudes. Yeah, Trip Lee loves Hillsong United. Hillsong United, who is furthered along by a rooted theology of you need more money. Signs and wonders, cheap thrills and entertainment. Partnering with Bethel, etc. 
Trip Lee loves these guys. He loves their false worship. He loves their leading people astray with, I couldn't even call it superficial theology, it's non-existent theology, because the God that they proclaim is not found in the confines of any Bible. Perhaps the Message Bible, I don't know, or the Hillsong version, if they have one. That's Trip Lee with his friends at Hillsong. Here's Trip Lee, excited to be a part of this. Tickets going fast, so don't wait. It's all about those tickets, isn't it, Pastor there you go. Louis Giglio. David Crowder. Remember the guy that was promoting the Eucharist and referring to the church, the Catholic church? There's his buddy Lecrae, of course. There's Carrie Job from Gatewood Church, Andy Mineo. And uh, who do we got down here? Some other, some other band. Well, but this is the Passion Conference. Louis Giglio's Passion Conference. Trip Lee wants you to get those tickets because they're going fast. Oh, Here he is at another one. Excited to be with my passion friends for the next few days. St. Peter's, Missouri. Tonight, who do we have on the roster there? Featuring Passion, the Passion Band, which includes Kristen Stanfield. Remember, let's bring the walls down and promote unity. Louis Giglio, the Pope Kisser. Travis Green. Levi Lusco, the one that's on uh, tour with Bethel. And uh, Trip Lee. How nice. Trip Lee. There he is, side by side with Levi Lusco. I don't know if we can... And make that a little bigger. There's Trip Lee, Levi Lusco, Louis Giglio. Here's an invitation with Matt Marr, the Catholic, 10th Avenue North. And of course, down here, you got Trip Lee with a message by Skip Heitzig. This was at a, at a, at a Calvary Chapel where Levi Lusco's younger brother is a so-called pastor. There's Trip Lee on stage just before... Uh, or sorry, yeah, just before Matt Marr came on stage. Uh, actually, he was just immediately before they took an offering. Uh, but uh, anyway, you saw the flyer. I'm not sure why this is uh, having some pro- uh, problems loading. But um, there he was, Trip Lee and Matt Marr, so-called leading people in worship at a Calvary Chapel. Isn't that something? So Trip Lee doesn't mind touring with Catholics. Trip Lee doesn't mind touring with somebody who's a part of the Bethel Collective and a friend of the Hillsong movement. Heck, Trip Lee's a good friend of the Hillsong movement. Those are his friends. Ah, oh, but you thought he was sound, right? You thought he could preach the gospel like nobody's business. And there he is promoting Hillsong, promoting David Crowder, the Passion Band, Levi Lusco, and Matt Marr. You must be kidding me. You must be kidding me, all you discerners who like Trip Lee. There he is on a massive flyer, Hillsong United guest speaker, Trip Lee. So much for being sound in the faith, right? Trip Lee. Where's Trip Lee going to find himself real soon? Right next to none other than, uh, uh uh-oh, wait for it. Up there he is next to John MacArthur. Yep, there's Trip Lee. There's John MacArthur at uh, Keith and Kristen Getty's Sing Conference. So, just when you thought, oh, you thought this was a a more conservative group, well, Ravi Zacharias, who I've done an entire report on, also found himself at the Passion Conference. He also finds himself at Hillsong Conferences, promoting the whole Hillsong movement. He also finds himself at Rick Warren's church, saying that Rick Warren and his church are uh, one of the greatest churches of a generation. Ravi Zacharias also found himself at the Together 2016 event, which was radically ecumenical. You can see some of the key players. There's Hillsong, there's Lecrae, Francis Chan was there, Christine Kane, Kirk Franklin, Carrie Job. Where's Ravi Zacharias? He's, well, he was there. Oh, there he is. Ravi Zacharias, Josh McDowell, right? These are supposed to be two of the leading apologists of the ages. I have books from both of these guys that I've purchased at, at times. There they were. Well, there was Catholics pleading for unity, Pope Francis on the screen urging unity. Again, if this is not the great apostasy, it is a great apostasy. So Trip Lee and Lecrae, oh, by the way, they're Shane and Shane down here. We'll touch on them in a second too. But Trip Lee doesn't want to be labeled a Christian rapper no, any more than his friend Lecrae does. And Trip Lee, he's friends with Hillsong. He's friends with Louis Giglio, the Pope Kisser. He's friends with Levi Lusco, according to him. These are his friends. He's glad to be touring with his friends. 
Well, I want you to hear what Paul Washer said about Tripoli and Lecrae not too long ago. In the not too distant past, this is what Paul Washer has said and utterly, deafeningly, silently refused to repudiate. Paul Washer, who will, by the way, be speaking at the Shepherds Conference with John MacArthur coming up shortly, this is what he said. Yeah, um, what are your views on, like, Christian rap and Christian rock? Um, Lecrae and Tripoli are both friends of mine. Um... Now you you really think I'm cool, don't you? <laughs> but I consider it an honor for them to be my friends, not because they're rappers, but because they really seek to be men of God. And they are. They walk in integrity. But if they were here right now, they would tell you what they do is extremely dangerous. Well, I can give Paul Wish, uh, Washer credit for some unwitting form of prognostication here. Yeah, what they do, what they did was extremely dangerous because it was worldly then. And they've only snowballed from there. But he says he counts it a privilege to be friends with such men of integrity, men who stand for the truth, who seek to be godly. This was Paul Washer at a 2010 Legacy Conference with Lecrae and Francis Chan, before Francis Chan became what is nearly a full-blown Catholic at this point. By all means, please see the apostasy report on Francis Chan if you haven't seen it. All of this ties in together. We're just focusing on worship primarily, but know that behind the worship is ideology, worldview, theology. So even Paul Washer, observing for the last nine years as his friends of integrity snowball into promotions of Hillsong, the world, pansexuality, general worldliness has stood idly by and said nothing. The sin of Eli knocks at the door of Paul Washer. I say this sadly remorsefully, a man that I used to listen to. The thing that made Paul Washer known was his boldness. Famous for rebuking a group of uh, youth students at a youth conference, talking about worldliness. I I think it was even in the context of worship, ironically, in Britney Spears concerts or some such. And as he's rebuking that, he said, I don't know why you're applauding, or I don't know why you're clapping, I'm talking about you. The very thing that he became known for is the very thing he jettisoned somewhere along the way, as his friend of integrity, Trip Lee, stands arm in arm with a heretic band, as his friend, Lecrae, stands arm in arm with every worldly radio station doing everything in his linguistic gymnastic ability to move away from the name of Jesus. No repudiation? For that matter, what about John Piper? What a sad state of affairs. So you that thought because you might be in a conservative circle, this doesn't extend to you. I tell you it does. For you who fancy yourself students of theology that listen to guys like Albert Moeller and Legan Duncan and Mark Dever and, and maybe you'll listen to people at the Sing Conference because, goodness, you got Johnny Erickson Tata and Ravi Zacharias and Francis Chan's good buddy David Platt here. No, no, no. This conference is infected as well. Shane and Shane, Shane and Shane are touring with one of the leaders of Passion, which we'll get into. Remember, Louis Giglio. Here is Paul Washer's friend Lecrae, David Crowder, Sadie Robinson. Elevation Worship, Carrie Job. there's John Piper and Levi Lusco. Anybody want to tell me why uh, John Piper's over here at the, uh, sorry, at the, yeah, Together for the Gospel Conference? Anybody? No? Anybody want to tell me why nobody's rebuking Trip Lee for all of his heretical associations? Anybody? No? Ah, 
Right? People don't mind pointing a finger at Hillsong, but when it comes to roost in their own backyard, then they got a problem with it. No, this extends to your friends Trip Lee and Lecrae as well. Ah, but I've heard him say true things. I'm sure you did. Does that give him carte blanche to do this? Trip Lee, in between Ravi Zacharias and Levi Lusco on tour with Bethel? Never mind that. There's Hillsong right below him. Christine Kane. This is a sea of heresy, and Trip Lee is a staple piece of it. He was there a couple of weeks ago. Elevation worship coming with Stephen Furtick's wayward narcissistic theology? Boy. Boy, isn't this something. What does Christine Kane have to say? And I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to stand in the gap for my generation. Yes, we're going to throw away legalism. Yes, we're going to throw away misogyny. Yes, we're going to throw away racism. Yes, we're going to throw away lovelessness. We're going to get rid of the junk, but we're going to stick to the supply. His name is Jesus. They're only going to stick to the name Jesus. All of that was just clever language to cloak social justice agendas. That's it. Because what she means by misogyny and racism are not classical definitions. What she means is that if you have a problem with the biblical teaching that women aren't supposed to have authority over men in an official teaching capacity or eldership in a church, that's misogyny. Right? And if if there doesn't appear to be enough diversity according to the standards of the world, then somehow you're a racist. That's all this is. So she's going to stand in the gap. Well, Trip Lee was a part of this whole nonsensical conference with Louis Giglio, the Pope kisser. So here they are, a bunch of different conferences, King and Country, Skillet, John Christ, I think he got kicked off of this one. Lecrae, Crowder, Andy Mineo, Zach Williams, Mac Powell, Pastor Chad Veach, hireling Chad Veach, rightly Sarah Reeves, Ledger, KB, Tadashi, Disciple, Land of Color, Project 86, Fit for a King, 1K Few, Red Jumpsuit Apparatus. I mean, look at all these people. This is at the Uprise Fest. Okay, I don't remember that one. What up, Erg? All right. Death Therapy. Well, that sounds uplifting. What do we have here? Creation Fest, David Crowder, Skillet, Elevation, Hillsong, Kerry Job, Leisure, 10th Avenue North, Andy Mineo, right? I don't know who pff, half of these people are, but perhaps you're familiar with some of these names. Do you see just how integrated it is? The Hunts, Nomads and Natives, Selena Lena, there's nothing about this looks any different than the world. So here it is. All of these different artists coming together, all marketing, all business, all entertainment, no truth. Or the truth that you get is mixed with so much error. Um, it's impossible to chew the meat and spit out the bones. You're getting a completely tainted substance altogether. There's Soul Fest 2020. Lecrae, Big Daddy Weave. Propaganda, right? David Crowder, there you go. All of them. Just just a constant sea of nonsense. Switchfoot, Zach Williams, my goodness, Matt Marr. It's all the same people. It's everybody that you know in the mainstream Christian, contemporary Christian music industry. It's a big pile of heretical, levinous nonsense. And they're all a part of it. Every last one of them, they wouldn't be in there if they weren't. You wouldn't get signed by Capital Christian Music Records if you went against the grain, if you objected. I talked to uh, a young man, uh, he might be older than me, but uh, sounds young, really nice guy named Jason, who was part of the late 90s, early 2000s Christian band Justified. And uh, we talked for some time about a lot of these things after the skillet video. He said I could share some of this. This will be brief, but he confirmed some things that I had already intimated at and then some and began to tell me how they effectively got blackballed from the Christian music industry for daring to speak up about some things, for having a real passion and a real ambition to serve the Lord and having a capacity to sing and so forth. 
not knowing how to express that, and then seeing things behind the scenes. Well, why are they operating this way? Aren't we supposed to be Christians? He toured with Skillet and John Cooper. So he confirmed many of the things that uh, I hinted at and some more things I didn't know. And I believe it was, I'm going to share one particular story. I believe, if memory serves me correct, this was in relation to Matt Redman, who was playing for some pro-life event um, where they might hire, it was a fundraiser for a, to help women thinking about abortion and so forth. And typically the singers are given a, uh, they, they set the fee before they go to, you know, perform at these functions. So the fee was already agreed upon. And apparently what happened is, as they do at fundraisers, they collect funds. It's the whole point of the dinner, right? It's a massive giving specifically for one universal cause. Nobody's under, nobody's getting blindsided with an envelope. They came there with the express purpose of giving to this cause. And so they've come to have dinner and so forth. And they brought somebody to sing. Well, apparently after the collection was taken for this charity, the artist in question, which I believe was Matt Redman, wanted a cut of that as well. The fee that they had agreed upon before he got there wasn't good enough for him. Then he saw that there was a collection taken up and he wanted a piece of that. A piece of the collection that was specifically for uh, to help mothers considering abortion. Now again, if memory serves me correct, I'm not saying that as a statement of fact, but I'm pretty certain that's how the story went. How despicable. How incredibly despicable, but somehow unsurprising. Speaking up about certain things will absolutely get you blacklisted, will absolutely get you shunned from a group. You think they'd be invited to tour with people if they said, hey, wait a second, uh, Bethel Music teaches heresy. Do you think you'd be invited to tour with them? I think not. You keep your mouth shut and you go along to get along or you're not getting a piece of that pie. All the people you see on this list serve a God, but it's not the God of the Bible. It's a God of their own design. It's the God of money. It's the God of this world. It's some other God with a little G. But there they all are. Right? Rock the desert. Skillet, Disciple, Lecrae, Carrie Job, etc., etc. You get the picture. But you didn't think this extended to Greg Laurie and the Harvest Crusades? There's Greg Laurie. There's For King and Country. There's The Passion Band with Kristen Stanfill. There's Jeremy Camp. There's Lecrae. There's Phil Wickham and Chris Tomlin, both tour mates of Joyce Meyer, the Newsboys, Daryl Strawberry. Greg always has to have some celebrity there. Yes, the Harvest Crusades are quite infected. Greg Laurie is quite compromised. And if you watch the apostasy report on Calvary Chapel, you'll see more on that. Greg Laurie finds himself in all sorts of compromised positions these days. Because he got a little taste of the fame. He got a little taste of the spotlight and has been trying to live out his desire to be a rock and roll star through the avenue of the so-called church. Greg Laurie, Mr. Hollywood himself. Despicable. Oh, I'm sure you've heard a a true thing or two. And it's been followed up with all kinds of poison. Especially in the form of worship here. Uh, Here is, uh, what is this, Phil Wickham at the Harvest Crusade. Oh, there's Levi Lusco. Remember? Remember the guy that tours with Bethel? It's Greg Laurie's good friend, little protege. Again, Greg Laurie has a background in the Calvary Chapel movement as well. And so does Levi and his family. There's Greg, there's Levi, there's Chris Tomlin. One big, happy, famous family. Where truth comes second to networking. Where the show must go on. 
Ah, don't trouble me with doctrine and theology. Give me a good singer and a charismatic preacher, and I don't care what else you promote. Hirelings, thieves and robbers, the whole lot. You got guys like Jack Hibbs promoting this? Hey, Pastor Greg, thank you. Thank you on behalf of our church, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. And can I say for believers across the land, because you've kept yourself clean, you've kept yourself usable, you've kept yourself faithful to the call of God on your life. Wait, wait, wait a second, Jack. Greg's kept himself uh, clean, clean and usable. Is that what you call the passion band? Hmm? Whose leader, Louis Giglio, is meeting up with the Pope? Doing Hillsong conferences with Bethel Church? Hmm? Driven by the theology of the heretic Bill Johnson, whose church teaches astral projection with children? This is insane. You call that clean? Hmm? How about Lecrae? He wants to do songs with uh, whatever, Monet? That's clean? Love and Hillsong? Love and the Grammys? Doesn't want to be called a Christian artist? Hmm? You call that clean, Jack? Jeremy Camp, Phil Wickham, and Chris Tomlin touring with Joyce Meyer? Among other things, embracing Matt Marr and his Catholicism? You you call that clean? I call it harlotry. That's what I call it. I call this a whole batch of spiritually transmitted diseases. But Jack Hibbs loves the Harvest Crusades and just can't tout that Greg Laurie is so clean and usable and faithful. This isn't faithful. This is treason. This is ridiculous. But here's Shane and Shane. Hey, Shane here. And Shane. Shane. And Shane. There. We are coming to you, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, January the 17th, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. All right, Calvary Chino, that's, that's where Jack Hibbs is at. Well, there's Shane and Shane, okay? Shane and Shane are closely connected to John Piper, who, don't forget, is a... Uh, heavily involved in the Passion Conference with Christine Kane and Bethel Music, etc., etc. These guys are very close with John Piper. No problem there. Who else are they close to? Here they are at the Linger Conference with, there you go, Trip Lee and Ben Stewart. And if you'd like to see a whole apostasy report on Matt Chandler doing conferences with uh, heretics like Todd White, feel free to watch that one. But here's Shane and Shane touring with Trip Lee, who we've already established, And Ben Stewart. Who's Ben Stewart, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Ben Stewart is the hireling at Passion City Church in Washington, D.C. Sound familiar? Well, that's because it is. Church, and obviously you know this guy standing next to me, Ben Stewart. You know him well. And I just wanted to say on behalf of Passion City Church, Passion City Church, D.C., our entire team here to you, uh, Pastor Ken, and to all of you at Faith Bridge, we are so grateful for your generosity and support as we're launching out into Washington, D.C. with Passion City Church, D.C. And your love for Ben and Donna is... Un- yeah, so Ben Stewart is under the direct leadership of this deceptive man who just had Bill Johnson at his uh, Passion Conference uh, last year. And this year might as well have had Bill Johnson who finds himself at the Hillsong Conference with uh, Brian Houston and the whole lot of them, right? The the same Louis Giglio right here who's greeting Pope Francis. That's Ben Stewart. Ben Stewart is part of the Passion Movement with Kristen Stanfill and the Passion Band that you saw touring with all these people. Well, Shane and Shane has no problem lingering with Ben Stewart, Trip Lee, Matt Chandler, and others. But you thought they weren't affected because they seemed a little more wholesome and bluegrassy or something. Well, I'll confess, they have great voices. I'm sure they're talented musicians. That does not excuse what's happening here. They have a whole thing called the Worship Initiative where they teach you how to play songs from everybody we just listed. Chris Tomlin, Matt Marr, etc., etc. They got a whole list of basically every Christian artist you can think of. Here's Ben Stewart, again, on tour with Shane and Shane, who Jack Hibbs invites to the Calvary Chapel Church. Here's Ben Stewart. Join us in welcoming Pastor Ben Stewart at the Kingdom Bound 2019 lineup. What is the Kingdom Bound conference, you ask? Well, here it was in 2019, last year. 
Well, you had for King and Country, you had David Crowder, Skillet, Bethel Music, Passion, Danny Gokey, right? All the usual suspects and a thousand others. And then, of course, you had Ben Stewart. Yes, Ben Stewart is very much involved with everybody we just talked about. All of them. No problem promoting Bethel Skillet. Never mind his own his own uh, father of the faith, so to speak, Louis Giglio, who finds himself warmly embracing a man who could rightly be described as embodying so much of the so many of the attributes of the Antichrist that it's almost impossible to have a conversation about the topic of Antichrist without talking about the papacy. This is a total loss. This is not a light matter. All of them compromise from start to finish. Jesus culture, Hillsong, all of it. This is the 2020 conference. From start to finish, the Christian music industry as we know it is absolutely, without a doubt, completely corrupt. And I can tell you honestly, I'm stopping for time's sake now, this easily could be an eight-hour video. We have only scratch the surface of just how bad this is, but to give a complete overview, when you see Nikki Gumbel and Brian Houston in the Passion Conference and Matt Redman and Matt Marr, who's an open, outspoken Catholic, and Chris Tomlin and on stage with Joyce Meyer and Phil Wickham and down and down and down the line we go, Bethel music and the crazy astral projection that comes out of that church and Jesus culture, which is also an offshoot of Bethel Church, Hillsong, etc., All of these artists are touring together because truth does not matter to them. So what do you do? Now that's the question, isn't it? What do I do? You've just taken away all of my worship artists. Who am I supposed to listen to? Who do I listen to now, Josh? Who do you listen to? Well, I'm going to give you a brief answer here. You might not like it. But there's a massive assumption in that question. Because this question presupposes that something is a necessity rather than a convenience, rather than a creature comfort exclusive to our modern era. It was only about 60 years ago, maybe 70 at the earliest, when there was any form of privately controlled music in a vehicle. Some older vehicles had record players put in them. And then around the mid-60s, the 8-track tape came into your vehicle. Prior to this, you were at the disposal of the radio. And prior to the invention of the radio, well, this just wasn't an option. It is a convenience that we get to listen to people singing. This is not a requirement or a necessity. But look how accustomed we've come uh, become to uh, our modern creature comforts. You know, the apostles didn't just get to pop in technology and listen to somebody sing to them. You know what they did? They had songs that they sang to themselves. That doesn't mean things weren't written. Book of Psalms. Written. Where good theology abounds. Which comes first, before you start singing. Who am I going to listen to? If you're asking the question as if it's an absolute necessity that you have something to stick into your headphones and your iPod, maybe you're asking the wrong question and you've become too accustomed to comforts. It's not a necessity. And I'm not saying there aren't people that you can listen to. What I am saying is that as it concerns the mainstream contemporary Christian music industry as we know it, it is completely and utterly corrupt. And this is the tip of the iceberg. You are witnessing apostasy on quite a grand scale as it concerns our Western world and the modern evangelical state. All of them are in it for business. All of them are doing what is good to allow the show to press on. 
have you have you even thought about uh, n- not depending on some artist to serenade you? Because until very recently in human history, this was not a luxury anybody else enjoyed. It is merely a luxury of the 20 and 21st century. What did Christians do in the 1700s? They sang songs to themselves. They filled themselves with good theology. They filled themselves with the Bible or perhaps good hymns. You, you get yourself an old hymn book from a couple hundred years back and you compare what's written in there to some of the lyrics you find here. Tell me there's not a chasm of difference. I don't know who you should listen to. I'm not saying you should listen to anybody. Maybe you can find some nondescript choir. Maybe there's some uh, good old hymns sung by somebody. I think there are people who do produce music um, who aren't part of this. You're not going to know their names, though. They're not going to show up at your church because they're not a part of that circuit. And the only way to become a part of that circuit is to, is to be marketable and to compromise. So you might find some people here and there. The internet is a vast region. What I am telling you is that if your church is supporting the ministries of anybody we just listed, you are sitting under, at best, the leadership of a negligent buffoon or a hireling. And if you show them this video and they have an objection, ah, he's too opinionated, that's too rash. If they give you something other than a sound argument, a sound biblical argument against this, by the way, if you have questions about some of these things, please see the video I did on guilt by association, which this is not. These are clear-cut instances of cooperation, partnership, and arm-in-arm Amos 3.3 fellowship. You don't get to link hands in fellowship with people promoting falsehood and not get tainted yourself. And if somebody tells you otherwise, that person is not fit to teach anybody. If they say that truth doesn't matter and you can have fellowship with somebody like Bethel Church, you're sitting under the direction of a hireling. Now, this is largely going to apply to Most megachurches, which I would say are fundamentally wrong in the first place. But I don't doubt that there are real Christians sitting in them that need to come out. And perhaps, just perhaps, this might be the wake-up call you need to see just how bad it is. And when you voice your concern to that associate pastor, Hey, did you know Chris Tomlin's touring with Joyce Meyer? Did you know Matt Redman leads worship for Joyce Meyer? And finds himself at the ecumenical Holy Trinity Brompton Leadership Conference with Pope lovers and all sorts of stuff with Nicky Gumbel. And they say, ah, who told you that? Ah, well, his, this song is good. Ah, sometimes he sings and covers old hymns and they're good theology. What's it to us? That person is a hireling. And you would do well to run away from them a little leaven. Leavens the whole lump and it will leaven you too. If you tolerate error, it's a matter of time before you'll be blinded by it. And if this is God's means of sending you a wake-up call, I pray you listen. Because this is not a joke. And this has been a long time coming. And again, any one of these people could be talked about. And please, view some of the other apostasy reports and see how all of this is integrated. This is on a massive scale. Everything that we know in American evangelicalism, this whole circuit, the, the modern church operates much like a talk show, which is an entirely different topic all by itself. They've become platforms for these artists, publishers, record labels to promote their artists and to sell their wares. And you'll find many of them on tours, touring from one church to the next. Conveniently, around the time they're selling a new album. It's not an accident. That's what you see in the world. That's what you see on late night talk shows. There's a movie coming out. The celebrity goes to sit down with a late night talk show host to promote the movie. 
Oh, you got a new book coming out? Well, the book publisher is going to put you on tour to go to this mega church and that mega church and all the way around, but it's massive in the music industry. And because the so-called worship experience has become arguably the centerpiece, the drawing lure for the modern evangelical church, they have to imitate these people because business must go on for them as well. And they're not going to chance dwindling numbers for the sake of integrity and truth. Nope. We'll create a stage show that looks like Beyonce, even to the world. That's how they describe it. Boy, this looks like a rock concert. Well, that's because it is. It's worldly. It's sensual. It is there to entice you. And they are battling for your mind. And if you don't guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, again, it's a matter of time before you will be blinded by it all.